expected to be honest and hard working but if that's all there was to it a trained robot could do the job much better what a civil servant must have is respect for ethical values difference between right and wrong compassion fair mindedness giving credit where it's due defending and standing by one's juniors when they make bona fide mistakes not be yes men and given to unreasonable demands from one's bosses for the sake of uh, a prime posting or a senior after retirement these are attributes which a civil servant should try and cultivate these are all covered in this book and young officers who are just starting their service will find this book of immense value anil has come out with another wonderful book which he has named ethical dilemmas that face a civil servant he has highlighted the problems which a civil servant is likely to face in his career and which will test him in various ways but he has advised that you must stick to an ethical approach to life and in administration because that is the only way of winning the confidence of the people and if you have win the confidence of the people whom you are serving half the task is done this book is going to be useful for all those who are aspiring to get into the civil service as it will make them familiar with the problems they will face and it is also very useful to those who are already serving because it will sh show them how uh, such problems which anil faced could be met and how he could succeed in his life as a career civil servant what is essential is that you must stick to a principle approach you must keep this principle in mind that what matters is the welfare of the people you serve and by showing this anil has in a way highlighted what should be the role of an ideal civil servant thank you a productive and purposeful career in public service has to be based on a good value system and on an uncompromising acceptance of ethical principles any person aspiring to serve the public through the civil services must read anil swaroop's book because it addresses conflicts and dilemmas and strengthens your ability and your resolve to address those as you go along it's anil swaroop is to be congratulated and commended for this book it's his second book on the civil servants the backbone of our administration and governance of india and in this book he has covered a wide range of issues which civil servants face in terms of values in terms of ethics in terms of integrity in terms of honesty indeed those are the challenges which all of us face but being from the civil service he has first hand experience of what civil servants go through and it's a great contribution at this time especially this book is not only relevant for civil servants it's relevant for everybody and particularly for young people
servants are expected to be honest and hard working but if that's all there was to it a trained robot could do the job much better what a civil servant must have is respect for ethical values difference between right and wrong compassion fair mindedness giving credit where it's due defending and standing by one's juniors when they make bona fide mistakes not be yes men and give in to unreasonable demands from one's bosses for the sake of uh, a prime posting or a senior after retirement these are attributes which a civil servant should try and cultivate these are all covered in this book and young officers who are just starting their service will find this book of immense value anil has come out with another wonderful book which he has named ethical dilemmas that face a civil servant he has highlighted the problems which a civil servant is likely to face in his career and which will test him in various ways but he has advised that you must stick to an ethical approach to life and in administration because that is the only way of winning the confidence of the people and if you have win the confidence of the people whom you are serving half the task is done this book is going to be useful for all those who are aspiring to get into the civil service as it will make them familiar with the problems they will face and it is also very useful to those who are already serving because it will sh show them how uh, such problems which anil faced could be met and how he could succeed in his life as a career civil servant what is essential is that you must stick to a principle approach you must keep this principle in mind that what matters is the welfare of the people you serve and by showing this anil has in a way highlighted what should be the role of an ideal civil servant thank you a productive and purposeful career in public service has to be based on a good value system and on an uncompromising acceptance of ethical principles any person aspiring to serve the public through the civil services must read anil swaroop's book because it addresses conflicts and dilemmas and strengthens your ability and your resolve to address those as you go along mr anil swaroop is to be congratulated and commended for this book it's his second book on the civil servants the backbone of our administration and governance of india and in this book he has covered a wide range of issues which civil servants face in terms of values in terms of ethics a very good afternoon and a good evening sorry to everybody i hope everyone is safe in their homes and everybody in the family has been well as well it is a privilege and a complete honor for me amrit singh chopra a director of unique publishers and unique shiksha to present to you this entire discussion today with an eminent panel that we are truly blessed to have today with us we are also very very excited for the launch of mr anil swaroop's second book of course you may be aware of his first book uh, which was a best seller so it has been an honor as i was saying to be associated with swaroop sir L working with him has been a true learning experience and i'm really eager to hear more and more opinions about the book because the first few that we have been receiving have been truly humbling and very exciting for all of us so to host uh, today's session we have with us someone who is a very well known face the anchor and editor of some of the most viewed shows on news channels the managing editor of cnbc and the moderator for today's event we have with us also whom we have very very privileged and honored to have 
is Mr. Gurcharan Das, who is an intellectual, a columnist, best-selling author, I'm sure whom all of you are very well aware of, and Sir has been kind enough to write the foreword of the book. We also with, have with us Madam Tuktuk Ghosh, who is also a retired IAS officer, last served as a secretary and financial advisor of the Road, Transport and Highway Ministry. She continues an active post-retirement life with involvements in the private sector and the welfare and upliftment of the marginalized. We have with us Dr. Ambrish Mittal, uh, who he again requires no introduction. Sir is very, very popular, very well known and somebody who is truly respected for all the life-saving support that he's given to millions and millions of people, including my own father. We also have with us uh, Mr. Anil Swaroop, the author of the book, a TED Talk speaker. The list for his introduction just keeps going on and on. On request from him, I'll try and keep it short. Sir, of course, as you know, we've already spoken about today, is the author of Not Just a Civil Servant, his first book, which is a bestseller. He's held various key positions through his tenure as a civil servant. His last few positions being the Education Secretary of India and the Coal Secretary of India. A lot of these instances and a lot of his postings and a lot of the experiences that he's gathered over the years are covered in this book, both for the benefit of current serving bureaucrats to be able to learn and get inspired from the stellar work that Sir has put in, and also for aspiring bureaucrats to be able to learn how to become a stellar civil servant. So without further ado, I will hand over the session to Shireen Bhan. And uh, so Shireen, hand over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Amrit. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, it's such an honor and a privilege to, uh, to be doing this for a second time. I had the privilege of uh, moderating uh, Mr. Saroop's first book launch as well. And I vividly remember uh, that it was a Sunday evening at the Constitution Club. It was a packed house then, and I understand that even uh, online on this Zoom call that we're doing, it is a packed house. So uh, I'm really glad that uh, that Mr. Saroop's writings continue to evoke uh, so much interest. Uh, you know, for people who've read the first book and if you haven't had the opportunity to read the second, I think both these books are really practitioners' guides uh, for people who are contemplating a career in the civil services or for people who are already in the civil services and dealing with some of the ethical dilemmas that Mr. Swaroop so candidly uh, and openly speaks of in this book. Uh, I intend to, or I would like to try and keep this as interactive as possible so that we can actually engage and have a free-flowing conversation, uh, share ideas and thoughts. And our panelists here, Mr. Kutcher and Das, Dr. Ambarish Mittal and uh, Ms. Ghosh have uh, have consented to take as many questions as possible because we do have about 3,000 odd people who have registered for this webinar. So the idea really is to make this as interactive uh, a brainstorming session as possible. I uh, pulled out a few excerpts from the book that I think really capture the substance of uh, the issues that uh, Mr. Saroop is trying to address and highlight uh, in the second book of his. And I think it sort of also lays out the roadmap uh, for what needs to be discussed in terms of uh, and a, a road forward. Um, let me start by, by putting the first excerpt on the table. Uh, on page 203, uh, Silent Conscience is uh, the title of the chapter. Mr. Swaroop says, civil servants are undoubtedly fundamentally risk averse. In their climb up the proverbial ladder and forgetting lucrative post-retirement assignments, this non-committal demeanor was certainly a favorable factor. That's probably the reason why they usually allow a wrong to be done right under their noses and wait for someone else to correct it instead of taking the initiative themselves. This, uh, uh, this excerpt takes me back to a conversation I very recently had with uh, Mr. R.C. Bhargav, also a former civil servant and chairman of Maruti Suzuki. And he believes that one of the big reasons that uh, the civil services tends not to live up to the expectations of good governance or the idea of governance is the fact that civil servants believe in a safety first approach. So I want to get thoughts of, uh, of our panelists here on whether that is one of the challenges, the safety first approach that is held back uh, uh, the civil service from, from delivering on the key responsibility of governance, as Mr. Swaroop says. And I want to highlight a second excerpt before I get Mr. Swaroop to open the conversation because this really sets up uh, what needs to be done 
in terms of the road ahead. All is certainly not well with the senior civil service. There is indeed enormous scope for improvement. The critical question is whether just tinkering with measures like the move for natural recruitment will bring about an improvement in the quality of governance. Unfortunately, there has so far been no concerted or sustained effort at managing the senior service level in a comprehensive manner. The steps have been ad hoc in nature. Natural recruitment is also one such effort. What really needs to be done is to look at the manner in which recruitment takes place. The in-service training, transfers, assessment of officers, incentives and disincentives by the ways of promotions and selections to critical posts. However, before taking a call on all of these aspects, it would be essential to determine what is required in an officer who mans the senior civil service. So without further ado, Mr. Saroop, I think that's a good segue for me to bring you into the conversation and tell us, you know, You've detailed uh, in a very granular fashion the ethical dilemmas that you've had to face. Uh, whether doing the right thing uh, is something that uh, that uh, suits the service, suits the officer in question, uh, the political class. What happens when you're caught at the political crossfire? Share with us some of those stories and what compelled you uh, to write this book today. you'll have to unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shireen. Thank you. Thanks a lot, all the audience here. You know, the, the primary reason why I read this book was the conversation that started after Not Just a Civil Servant. It was, it was very clear to me that more required to be said about it, and probably some roadmap needs to be worked out. There is no denying the fact that the civil servant does fail a lot of ethical dilemmas, and that come comes out in the first couplet that I use. Mukta sir sees in the key kya jab se asane hai, ya teer bhi chalane hai, parinde bhi bachane hai. And through the book, I try and bring about these dilemmas. But these are objective conditions about which the civil servant himself cannot do anything. But he can do a lot to himself. And I have always believed and I try to bring out in the book, umrubari hai bhool karta raha galit, bhool chere pati aina makta raha. So you can't do much to the mirror. Actually, you can do a lot to yourself. And the book is sandwiched between two couplets, one that I said earlier, and the next one. Khudi khukar buland itna ki har patir se pehle, khuda bande se kuchhe bata teri raza kya. It depends totally on the civil servant. Why? Because given this environment, there are a lot of civil servants who are doing well. So it's a question of where we are looking at. Are we looking at R.C. Bhargavas? Are we looking at uh, uh, Parmeshwara Nayars? Are we looking at officers who are able to perform despite these dilemmas? And the dilemma ceases to be a dilemma ultimately because the it all depends on the choice that an officer makes. And the officer does have a choice. And what I'm trying to prove through this book is that ethics pays, ethical conduct pays, especially in the day of transparency these days with very active media. The bureaucrat or civil servant cannot get away with things that he would have got away earlier. So he can if he wants, and ultimately the rewards are there. The other thing that I have in the book is that though there would be problems in following a particular path, whether honest or dishonest, in either path there are problems. The question is the civil servant will have to make a choice whether he wants to take one path or the other path. The choice is his. That's the point that I'm trying to make. It is nobody else's choice, and hence he should take the responsibility of the choice that he made. I can go on and on. It's there in the book, so I'll stop here. I'd rather listen to the panelists and probably respond to their questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Saroop, for the introductory comments. Uh, uh, let me get uh, Mr. Gurcharan Das, a writer, author himself, of many best-selling books, and uh, also uh, someone who's written the foreword for this book. Uh, uh, that Mr. Swaroop is launching today. Uh, Mr. Das, you know, you're, you're uh, someone who has looked at uh, dharma, karma, uh, ethical dilemmas, and, uh, uh, and you know, where one should draw the Lakshman Rekha, so to speak. Uh, in your assessment, uh, you know, as we look forward, what is it that you, you believe uh, we need to focus much more on? Well, I first thing to say is that I enjoyed the book. And I think every civil servant should read it, not only read it once, but every five years to remind himself of some of the basic principles. And I'm so glad 
that uh, Anil has used the storytelling technique. You know, India is the oldest storytelling culture in the world. We gave the world the Hitopadesha, the Kathit Sarit Sagara, the Panchatantra. All these are stories. And we were meant to learn how to act in the world through these stories. So it's very fitting that Anil should have uh, used this, I think, uh, method because it's a very, very powerful way to teach a lesson. And I think the most important lesson that this book offers, and this is something that I've all, I have believed and written about, is that in the real world, in the world of action and responsibility in building organization, in the world where you have to be a leader, attitude is more important than knowledge. Attitude is more important than skills. Attitude could be sometimes even more important than intelligence. And yet, what do we do? All are from kindergarten onwards. We are told knowledge, knowledge, exam passing, knowledge. And we are not prepared through our education, right through postgraduate, MBA, whatever. MBAs don't, uh, don't learn about uh, inculcating the right attitude. And then we make the mistake on top of that, that when we recruit people, whether for the civil service or in the private sector, we and look at the average interview in that takes place. It's all about what you know. And that's not what counts. What you want to know in that interview is how does the person solve problems? Is he collaborative? Is she, is, is she a li good listener? And, and what does the person do under adversity? These are the things that make a leader. And, and so, anyway, um, I've had the good fortune in both my business career as well as in my career as a writer and commentator to have met many leaders. And I find leaders had three basic traits in common. First was not intelligence, but I would say was determination, persistence, almost stubbornness about what you believe in and what you think is right. The second quality, again, not intelligence, but humility. Now, humility doesn't mean that you're not ambitious, but your ambition is for your project your work, your, 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 uh, your, what you're doing, rather than for your next promotion or for your stock options or whatever. And the third quality is integrity. And that, of course, is the main theme of, of Anil's work, of, of, of this book. But also, the theme of determination and humility runs, runs through, 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 through the book. So I would say that I would say that both in the private sector and the public sector, we should hire for attitude and train people in knowledge and skills and other things. So I've been privileged to write the foreword to this book. And in the spirit that Anil has set in the book, I have also told a story. And it's a story uh, about a, a temporary security guard who came to work in our company. And he came from uh, Western Maharashtra. He didn't know much English. He was metric pass, no graduate. And yet, this fellow transformed the, our company and rose to become a director of the company. In other words, not a graduate, very few, little English, but had and was a dynamite. All the things I learned about leadership, I learned from this fellow. I've, I've uh, used, a, 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 I, I, I've not used his name. Uh, it may not be fair to him, but his, um, I've used the name Kaurde. 
which is a good Maharashtrian name because that's what he was, good Maharashtrian. <laughs> anyway, Kaude um, came to the office and he had a childlike curiosity to begin with. He, you could see that everything he was able to turn into some kind of game. So he didn't know English. <coughs> so he would listen to people speaking English. He, in those days, we used telexes. Now, telexes were written in English. But within a few weeks, he had learned enough to operate the telex machine. He had a basic attitude of service to help people. So if somebody wanted tea, coffee, between his security rounds, he would be serving tea and coffee to people. Then he'd pick up the telephone and answer the telephone. And he even learned to uh, run the projector because we were a consumer product company and we made a lot of advertising. Anyway, the, the long and short of it is that he was, he, he was such a change agent that it became more enjoyable to work in the office after 6 p.m. than during the day. And I saw people actually are staying later and later in the office because everything worked. And if you had a question, you would say, ask Kaude. And he had an answer. In fact, once I, was, I needed to get in touch with the finance director, and Kaude found out in a few minutes that he was in Delhi, staying at Ashoka Hotel, and he connected me. Nine months, eight months, seven, eight months later, uh, our telephone operator during the day, she wanted to go, she had to go on maternity leave. She was having a baby. And so uh, Kare went to the personnel, head of personnel. Now we call them HRD uh, directors. But he asked him whether he, he says, I'm tired of working at night. So give me a chance. I'll be your te temporary telephone operator until she comes back. And the personnel guy said, Kare, are you crazy? You don't even know. You don't know. We, you know, we are a multinational company. And frankly, you can't even pronounce the name of the company properly. You call a, you call the company Procter and Gamble. And so we, you know, you, we, you not, you'll make a bad impression as a telephone operator. Uh, and how will you deal with all these people speaking English? Anyway, poor Kare went away feeling, uh, you know, sad. But I heard through the great point. And I went to the head of personnel. I said, look, you know, give this guy a chance. If he doesn't work out after a couple of days, we'll get a, we'll get a temporary, uh, another person. <coughs> anyway, after two days, he gets on the, uh, as becomes our telephone operator. I get a call from our lawyers, Crawford Bailey. And our lawyer says, have you got a new EPPX system? I said, why? He said, well, you know, I, I used to wait till five or six rings before my call was answered. But now it's answered on the second ring. I said, our EPPX system is Kaude. And I went to Kaude. I said to him, you know, I was passing by. Uh, at lunchtime by the, tele, by the phone booth. And I said, you know, why do you answer the phone so promptly? And you know what he said? He said, he says, Mr. Das, you know, there may be a customer at the other end. And I don't want you to lose an order to, the, to our competitors. I mean, what a dynamite answer. I don't think our finance director would have put an answer to that question. But anyway, I just wanted to say that here was this guy who, you know, to another, once I overheard him talking to a woman, to a mother, and giving her advice on what to do for a child's cold and how good Vicks vapor up is when you put it in hot water. I mean, this is the kind of guy he was. And so I guess my point here is, I don't want to go on and on. I want to finish here. but. I just want to tell you that the qualities he brought are some of the qualities that Anil has illustrated in his book. And the one story was that one of our senior managers dropped his wallet in the toilet room. 
and Gaude found the money. There was a lot of money. He had withdrawn the money that day to give down payment for a house. And Gaude, on his own initiative, asked a colleague to look after the office. He took a taxi and went and delivered a lot of money. Uh, in those days, you had to pay cash. And I suppose you still do to pay a lot of cash. But I just wanted to say that what he had was this a childlike curiosity to learn. He had he had a habit of converting his work into play. He had an attitude of service, of helpfulness, problem solving for others, a basic humility, which was that he didn't care who got the credit. He just thought the work should be done. And that's very important. In that sense is what Anishkam Karma is all about that Krishna teaches to Arjun in the Gita. And finally, determination, that persistence, and, 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 and lastly, implementation. I learned that implementation is more important even than strategy. So that is the end of the story. Next time, if you, you we all want to fill our organizations with cowardice, hire for attitude, and train people in skills. You can't change attitude, but you can change skills. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Das. I think the uh, IAS should certainly be looking out for as many cowardice as possible. And I think the important aspect in that story, uh, beyond all the other attributes that you spoke of in terms of focusing on determination, persistence, integrity, uh, having the right attitude. I think what you said there about uh, about servicing the customer and the customer being at the end or at the center of everything that Gavre did, I think that is something that, uh, that we need to see much more of. And I think if the bureaucracy focuses on the customer uh, and the customer is at the center of the decision making, perhaps we would... Uh, we would see a very different approach to governance as well. Let me bring uh, Ms. Ghosh into the conversation now uh, to pick up from where we just left off uh, with Mr. Kuchandas. But I also want to bring to the conversation uh, one of the things that uh, Mr. Swaroop spoke of. And he said that uh, at the end of the day, every individual has a choice. The officer has a choice. But given, given the manner in which the system currently operates, and he speaks of this, he speaks of... Uh, uh, of you know, political interference, he speaks of getting uh, caught in the crossfire, etc. Uh, is it safer for officers to make no choice? Uh, and is that perhaps something that we're seeing or facing the consequences of? Uh, not making a choice has become the easier thing to do. Ms. Ghosh. Thank you, Shireen. Good evening and namaskar to all of you. I'd like to start by congratulating Anil, a dear friend, for the second book in less than two years, which will definitely be a bestseller like the first one. I also want to congratulate him for taking forward this sampad for the public conversation on governance. Because to my mind, his first book, not just a civil servant, was not just a book for him. It was much more than that. In fact, he's created a wonderful hub around which a buzz on good governance has developed. And in this book, the dilemmas of a civil servant, ethical dilemmas of a civil servant, we find that samvad further enhanced and deepened. And I see Anil doing much more in converting the second book also into a movement of people to put pressure on the civil service so that the mandate of the constitution of india which is basically a resolve of the people to give unto themselves good governance is actually fulfilled we have not been able to fulfill that and if somebody like anil who is an iconic achiever with a dream track record can hold up the mirror and delineate the cast of the bad, the dark, and the ugly, and say that something needs to be done right now by you, it means a lot. It's not the same thing as people from the outside trashing you and saying that you're useless. You can't be any better than this. And 
things would have been different had you not been there. That is the striking point about this particular print offering, as I call it. It's not a book. It's a print offering by Anil. And since he is from within, and he himself has achieved hell of a lot, he is now leading this campaign to bring about change. And I must add that he is not a demolitionist. He is not an anarchist. He is not a wrecker by any stretch of imagination. He would very much like to work within the given framework. And his 88 plus stories are not Amar Chitra Kathas. I'm sorry. They are not Amar Chitra Kathas with models. They are much, much more. The only thing that Anil has done is to pose the question after each chapter, each Katha, and ask, was it right? Now, if somebody like Anil can look back and revisit and question what he has done, which is impeccable, just think of what the others ought to be doing. You know, we always want to be self-righteous and say, we know it all. We are the greatest, we are the best, but unfortunately we are not. We have to accept that. We cannot continue to be in denial mode. And unless we accept that and strive towards change, we are not going to be able to fulfill the constitutional mandate which is our core and basic responsibility. I'd like to compliment Anil once more, because he is going to be one of the knights in white shining armor who will go ahead and make this thing happen. Hats off to you, Anil. Uh, thank you very much. And yes, we, we need uh, Mr. Swaroop and many more uh, knights in shining armor. And, and I, I have to say, I agree with you on the fact that he's, uh, uh, he's not, he learned, he has explained how he has learned to work within the system to make change happen. And there are several stories there where he explains that that is in fact possible. You don't have to be, uh, as you pointed out, demolitionist or an anarchist. You can still make change happen, even within the confines of the current system. But before I get Dr. Mittal in, I also want to read out another excerpt from the book, which I think again highlights uh, some of the issues that uh, Mrs. Farooq is speaking of. And he says, the civil servants cannot be absolved in responsibility for the current state of affairs. If the civil servant doesn't allow himself to be used, then he cannot be misused or abused. More often than not, there is a quid pro quo. It is the expectation of a reward from the politician that makes the civil servant weak. There is a price to be paid either way. Some civil servants choose immediate rewards. They usually end up paying a price subsequently but more than a personal price, it damages the institution of the civil service, bringing a bad name to the service as a whole. Uh, and I think that's going to be some of the uh, issues that we will hopefully uh, get a discussion going on is, how do you institutionalize what Mr. Swaroop is speaking of? How do you protect the institution from the bad apples? How do you reinforce the good that we're seeing in many of the stories that, and, and many of the individuals that he has highlighted through the course of this book as well. Dr. Mitra. You'll have to unmute yourself. Sorry, I guess I'm the only uncivil guy in this highly distinguished uh, civil audience. Uh, and I'll start by uh, trying to make sense of the title of the book. So it's about ethical dilemmas of a civil servant. Uh, Ethical, as we know, but I'll repeat, is different from legal. Uh, you could be very legal, but totally unethical at times. And it's also different from moral, which is a more general, quasi-religious sort of paradigm that is laid out for you. Ethics is your set of principles that you follow. And that, if you violate that, then you're being unethical. So ethical can also vary a little bit. And that's why I think Anil very uh, rightfully has, at the end of every chapter, as Ms. Gorse was mentioning, put that question mark, was it okay to do this or not? So the second part of the title is civil uh, servant. Uh, it's uh, it's actually, maybe it could be civil ruler, uh, coming from a non-bureaucratic uh, background, because I think the meaning servant has got no meaning, really. Everyone says they're a public servant. So you're a servant of the people. Are you a servant of the nation, which could mean people also? Or are you a servant of your political masters, or are you a servant of your boss, uh, your, your bureaucrat boss. And I think we've gotten lost there. I think this whole concept of servant everywhere is servant of the people. 
And I think that's where we are, we sort of, and I mean, the name is actually not correct, especially for uh, the privileged uh, IAS uh, in this country. Most of them really are not servants. They are rulers and they are masters. But there are exceptions, and you know, we, we see amazing results with them. The important part of the book itself is the fact that I completely agree with Mr. Das, the, his, uh, Anil's capacity for storytelling. Storytelling with a message, the stories are racy, they are spicy. And as someone who belongs to UP and Lucknow, uh, some of them had an instant connect with me. And I knew many of the people he was talking about there. Many of them were classmates like us, some were colleagues, some were friends. I think it is uh, fascinating for me how he has brought that in with some wisdom at the end, but not being pedantic, you're not being sort of preachy about it, and actually leaving it open-ended. So every story leaves you with still a question mark. Maybe you should have done this. Maybe I would have done this. Maybe this is the best way, which is exactly what you're talking about, our capacity to analyze and think, which is critical. So I really love that. And if you ask me for my personal favorite, which has the most impact, not the delightful short stories about about you know the rats and bats and about uh, people traveling in a taxi, 21 people in a taxi, but is the story about the then chief minister of the of UP during the Babri Masjid uh, time. And I think those stories are really telling, and they really tell you a lot about both the personality of the person who was the chief minister at that time and Anil himself. And I, for me, they were, because they are actually history. They are part of history. That could. That could be an important part when history is written. So I think that story had the maximum impact on me uh, as, as a reader. Uh, the, the second point uh, is about the definition, rather the third point, is about definition of ethical again. Because I think that if you are truly following all the, all the legal rules, etc., but you're not performing, actually you're unethical. I think errors of omission are as bad as errors of commission when you are in a management position. And I think really that is something that 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 some people get, there are two tracks to this. One is don't do, the, there are two tracks to people who are considered honest in the service. One is don't do anything outside, don't ruffle any feathers, don't tread on any toes. And this is not now or recent. Traditionally, such people have made it to the highest echelons of of civil service. Those who've been careful not to rub people on the wrong side, they've stuck to the rules, they've not broken anything, but they've never sort of taken any initiative that would make a major difference. Such people in our system, not just in civil service, they've actually made it up through the government systems in every every service. And I think that's been a, I think that's important for me. That is also a serious problem with the system and at some level it's unethical. The other extreme, of course, is the people who are intoxicated by their goodness, by their honesty. And that becomes their only thing in life. So performance, I mean, what are you there for? It's presumed that you're honest. Why Tom Tom your honesty, man? I mean, you're supposed to be honest. You're supposed to deliver. You should judge on your delivery. When people start talking of, you cannot, I remember my father was also uh, a bureaucrat, uh, not in the civil service, but he was secretary of the legislative assembly in UP for donkeys here, 20 years or so. And there was this appointment of engineer in chief for irrigation at that time. Anil's dad was also in irrigation. And the chief minister, and they were sitting and they were discussing who should go in. And there was this gentleman whose only claim to the post was, there's no one as honest as me. So I think we should not in get intoxicated drunk on our honesty. Honesty is very important, but it is part of your uh, whole system. It is part of your ability to deliver. If you're just being honest and taking an extreme stand, and this brought that on very well, if you're taking an extreme stand and just pointing out dishonesty of others and living off that, if you're looking for Ramas all the time to become Ram, you know, that's, that's not the way. You have to be creative and you have to find your way. And for me, as, as a college mate and schoolmate, Ariel's greatest contribution has been that he has been able to deliver while being within the system. Which is why what he says in this book is of great importance for everybody. Because he has not violated the system anywhere. He has, he has, he has known where to stop. You know, he, he always knew where to stop and say, it's okay, it's beyond me. He had the wisdom 
to know the difference between things he can change and things that he cannot. And at the same time, he, he, he can, his integrity is unimpeachable, which is why he could write with such great candor. I mean, who would tell these stories? People wouldn't tell them because it would always reflect on them in some way. But he has very neatly put this, put this all together as a package for, for, for me, it was, it was great fun to read. You can pick it up from any page and read it because each one is a story. And if I may say so, it is, I think, more refined and it will have a greater impact than even your first book. So congratulations, Anil, for this absolutely amazing show, uh, uh, amazing production. It requires a lot of guts, a lot of skill, and hardcore honesty and integrity to come out with such a publication. Uh, I'm sure it will be a huge, huge bestseller. Uh, I personally love reading the book. And as I said, I could connect with so many things uh, that, that we have shared over the years. When I met him in 1990, after a gap of 15 years after we left Colvin, uh, he was director of information, something like that. His office was in the civil hospital, some premises, somewhere in that direction close to that. And I was going back to SGPGI. I was a professor there at that time, young, dynamic, and taking on everybody, you know, maybe arrogant also, you know, not worried about anything. And he said, next time you come to town, you must see me. So as I was heading back, I, I entered his room, and he was holding a meeting with lots of people. You have this system having lots of chairs in the room, of the HOD's room, and the people are sitting. And I entered, and he got up, and he said, hi, how are you? And I'm sure he doesn't remember it, because it was a gap of 15 years. And then he said, this is Dr. Mittal. He is uh, at SGPGI, this, that. And he was my class fellow. And just remember, he could have been occupying any of these cha chairs in this room if he chose to. He just chose to become a doctor. So uh, I, that stuck in my memory. There are very few people who think like that nowadays. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this. And I'll be happy to participate as we go along. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mittal, for sharing those stories. And I think. Uh, uh, you know, something that you spoke of that uh, a leader, whether the bureaucracy or otherwise, uh, should not get intoxicated by uh, by the need to, to be honest. I think that is something that uh, Mrs. Farooq also speaks of quite candidly uh, in the book. And whether uh, this approach has in fact curbed or killed any kind of innovation, entrepreneurship, out of the box thinking within the civil service, which I think is something that many people uh, quibble and argue about. But, uh, you know, let me, uh, let me go back to Mr. Swaroop and, and uh, pick up on some of the questions that he raises uh, in the book, for instance. Um, and Mr. Swaroop, I want to talk about uh, the chapter that you've put down for the price of silence, where you talk about dissent and you talk about the difference of opinion and how one can actually deal with dissent and difference of opinion within the bureaucratic setup. I know you very firmly do not believe in going public with dissent or difference of opinion. In fact, I think you've been quite candid in saying that you believe what the Supreme Court judges did uh, was an act of exhibitionism. I didn't say that exactly, but if I read between the lines, that's what you seem to suggest. So uh, what is it that you believe uh, a civil servant, a bureaucrat can do to ensure uh, that dissent where required and difference of opinion when important, especially to deliver for the customer, for governance? Uh, how do you ensure that that is in fact incorporated, or you can take, you know, make your voice heard where it needs to be? You're on mute again, sir. Okay. Sorry. Can I? Can I? Am I okay? No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I think it's the job of the civil servant to air his views. But where, that's very important. As a civil servant, he has no business to air his view in public. He can air his view in a meeting. He should air his view. He should write what he thinks right on the file, but not in public. Let me give you a small example. Since the discussion has become a bit serious, I should thank all the panelists for the work that they said. But one instance I must tell you. This, this was when I had come and joined Mr. Kalyan Singh Secretariat as Director of Information. I had been district magistrate before that. I recall distinctly one fine morning I was there, the chief secretary was there, there. And the chief minister, Mr. Kalyan Singh, was very agitated because seven meetings had been lined up on the following day on an election, an election day. There was a by-election happening. And he was very agitated. And he was saying, how will I do that? My ESSEC, ESSEC, and both the chief secretary and DGP were, you know, shaking, nodding their heads in agreement and saying, ha, sir, aap kaise saath meeting 
I couldn't hold myself. Look, I was young. I was nine, ten years in service, but I couldn't hold myself. I, I told him, sir, I was just a district minister. जब चीफ मिनिस्टर जिले में आता है तो बड़ी तैयारी होती है बहुत आशाएं होती हैं एक्सपेक्टेशन होती हैं तो चाहे दो मिनट के लिए जाए जाए जो भी सो ही लुक्ड एंगली टुवर्ड्स मी ही सेड मैं कैसे जाऊंगा द मोमेंट ही सेड मैं कैसे जाऊंगा द चीफ सेक्रेटरी स्टार्टेड नजिंग एंड इट वॉज विजिबल टू एवरी नथिंग टू की पॉइंट बट आई टू होल्ड माई सर आई टोल्ड द चीफ मिनिस्टर सर मेरा काम आपको बताना है निर्णय आपको लेना है तो देन ही स्टार्ट नथिंग मी इवन फास्टर दे वॉज स्पिन ड्रॉप साइलेंस फॉर अबाउट टेन सेकंड आफ्टर दैट देर आफ्टर द चीफ मिनिस्टर सेट अनिल जी आप ठीक है the nothing stopped fourth with any heart sir bilkul theek kar raha tha that what you know i can't forget that you know to me and i see that i saw that as secretary government of india and i've written that in my book that many of my colleagues agreed with me outside and when they went it inside they didn't speak their mind out i think we are doing disservice that's being intellectually dishonest i use that phrase in the book so dissent has to be there but not in the manner in which the supreme court judges there that's not the job they didn't set the right example And because they are also technically civil servants to go out and hold a media conference you know if you and i would have done it we would have to get the bars uh, in contempt of court but you know they got a bit of it and one chap became the chief justice of india now is member of parliament so you know but that's his job i can't say anything to him as far as i am concerned i have to decide for myself what is ethical for me ethics is that if i genuinely feel about an issue i'll speak up now the idea is not to force a change the idea is to do what you do you know the fundamental principle is what reinald nibor said lord grant me the serenity to accept things i cannot change courage to change things that i can and the wisdom to understand the difference between the two that i think the bottom line is you are not a revolution you are a past revolution if you want to do revolution i have not written in the book but i would suggest if you want to be a revolutionary pick up a jhadu and join a political party you have no business to be in civil service in civil service you have to follow certain discipline but your views should be expressed and finally if you are overruled and if the overruling is not illegal i think you have to go by it's no personal choice of mine I, there's no such thing as personal conviction so to say that i want this to be done no you are in civil service ultimately a decision maker takes all you said what you said you got overruled there is a chapter in my book where i felt something i was overruled and then i went ahead and did what i was asked to do so long as it is not illegal with civil like that's a different but otherwise i think you have to follow this Okay, Miss Ghosh, do you want to come in on that? Sorry, I, I was asking Miss Ghosh if she wanted to comment on that. Well, well, I I have gone through Anil's book with a lot of interest, and this particular chapter that you refer to, well, I agree with him, because you know there's no point going out into the public and making a big song and dance about something which you don't. end up finally standing by you know we talked about the person who is now entered the portals of sansad bhavan where did he start and where is he end so was dissent really the purpose or was it something else the way it is ended it makes us purpose to to the election commission is also similar you know so this is not the way to bring about any change because it's futile nothing going to come of it so if you're really interested in doing something positive you have to be able to work within the system in a very effective and meaningful way and there are ways and ways of doing it this is not it i agree with anil thank you okay dr mittal would you agree that uh, uh, that's not it because you know to to a, a, a lay person it, The, the view would be that look, if there is no recourse, if there isn't change happening, and you're becoming a sort of silent spectator, then are are you not failing in your job uh, to be the custodian and the guardian of good governance? And you're sort of allowing the system uh, to run uh, opposite to what it's supposed to do. I tend to agree with Anil. Uh, it's I think it's very very important that people air their views clearly within the forum they're supposed to be aired. I think that's true for us. I'll, let me give you a quick example. You know, if you're managing a difficult case or a difficult research project, you may fight about what treatment or whatever. You may fight the morning till evening and discuss and discuss. With, but if ultimately the team feels otherwise. then you will have to go with that you should not then go out and tell the patient's family actually i wanted to do this 
but I did this because no one agreed with me. So I, I think we have to all work in a system where there's a team and rushing to the media and social media nowadays has become such a such a fashion that it can actually be detrimental to the interests of all of us, especially when it comes to serious governance issues. And I'll make one point here. I have a question for Anil before you uh, yes. shut me up. And that question no, 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 is... No, no, I think so, I will shut you up. Please so, continue. So the question is about... Uh, you say that positive contributions should be highlighted, right? And you've done that consistently in your book. It's a double-edged sword. You know, uh, it's a double-edged sword because I think that you might be lowering the bar uh, a little bit by doing that. I think if people are doing great jobs like you and Ms. Ghosh and so many others I know, I mean, that's their job, right? So so at the moment we are saying that like, it is like, again, sorry, uh, that's the example that comes to mind. Doctors who claim credit for doing this or that, which is nothing new actually. They were supposed to do that. So somehow in my old fashioned way of thinking, it seems that we got to be careful that we're not giving credit for something that was supposed to be done by that person. Well, and I keep, me, can, yeah, I keep yeah, correcting me, me. young doctors for this, that, I mean, so what? So you're supposed to do that, right? So within the fraternity, yes, we get accolades, but why do you want accolades for this outside? It'll happen on its own. You know, I'll take the doctor's example itself. Look at the reputation that has come surrounded the doctors and they're getting thrashed up. People feel they're doing all wrong work. So don't you think their work needs to be highlighted for people to understand there's a lot of good work yeah. happening there. That is one. That's why I like Because right. there's so much negativity around it, including doctors. Yeah. You know, I know of doctors who do wonderful work. Yet, if you talk to a man on the street, he'll say doctors. You need to change that. How do you change that? By highlighting the good work. And hence, the work needs to be highlighted. Individuals also need to be highlighted just to demonstrate that good can be done because it has been done. It is being done and hence, there is a value around good work. No, if you take it for granted that good work in any case you are supposed to do and you're doing it, there's no value around it. You have to create that value. You have to create that recognition. I know it may not have been required a few years ago, but with social media going hammer and tongs negatively against doctors and others, we do need to create a parallel narrative and that's what Nexus of the Good is all about. That do create a parallel positive narrative and we try to do it My contention is it's high time that good people started talking good. You know, the tragedy is that we all like masala, and that's why we get negative news. Now, let's create a parallel narrative to talk positively about people. Yes. So that not only masala, no nation wants to know only also positive. <laughs> not the world has collapsed. I, I, I that's why I make a positive effort to appreciate the good work. Though one may say that it was their job, so what? What's the big deal? No, I think it's a big deal now. We have to counter the narrative. If you don't do that, I think the doctor will get trashed and one day even civil servant. <laughs> well, I, I just wanted, Sh uh, Shirin, to... Yes, sir, go ahead. I've, exp I've explored this question in, the, in my book, The Difficulty of Being Good, you know, on the Mahabharat. And this is where, in that episode, where Draupdi is going, is being disrobed and no one speaks up. And, and, and Vidura finally says in that episode that one half the punishment goes to the person who's guilty, a quarter goes to the person who helps the person who is guilty, the collaborator, and a quarter goes to those who are silent. So also the role of the whistleblower, I think all these things are very important. We, there is, Mr. Mittal is absolutely right. It's the, you must speak in the right forum. It was wrong to the justices to speak like that. I completely agree with that. And, and, but it is very important that we protect whistleblowers in our society also. And, 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 and so, uh, I mean, I, I, I wrote a column in, in the Times of India during the 2G scam about the silence of our prime minister at that time who knew that something was wrong and he did not speak up. So I, I, I think it's a, it's, it's a fine line. Um, it's a fine line. Uh, morality is not, ethics is not black and white. It is always a balance that we have to strike. 
And so, for a, in a in a a good CEO, in my view, he I'm talking about the private sector. He will listen to people. This is what the the ideal Japanese CEO is supposed to be doing. He listens to everybody's opinion. It's a one-hour meeting, and for 55 minutes, he listens to everybody's opinion. And finally, somebody has to make up, make a decision. He makes the decision, and after the decision is made, with a lot of fighting and you know dissent and everything, after the decision is made, nobody questions that decision. The problem in, a, in, in, in some bureaucracies, etc., and sometimes I've seen that in Indian companies particularly, that people will undermine the decision because they don't believe in it and they, didn't, they may have spoken up. But after a decision is made, whether you agree or not, you, the organization must implement it. And it must do it single-minded. I'm just putting some other flavor around sure. this you know, dissent inside an organization. No, that, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Das, for that. Uh, if anybody who's uh, uh, joining us on this Zoom uh, webinar or on YouTube has a question for our panelists, please do uh, send us your questions. We'll try and take as many of them as possible. We still have a, about, I think, 10 or 15 minutes to go. Or no, actually, we're pretty much running out of time. I, I want to address one of the other crucial issues that you speak of because it's linked to uh, to many of the conversations that we've had this evening, and that is in the chapter "Falling for Crumbs" uh, that Mr. Sarup has uh, has written, and he talks about the dilemma there. A large number of civil servants opt for post-retirement jobs in the government itself. Most of them would have worked in the government for three decades or more, yet they further preferred government assignments. This raises a number of questions some of which are ethical in nature. Should a government servant post-retirement apply, that's the word, apply for a job in the government? Should a government servant post-retirement accept an assignment in the government? Let me ask you that question, Mr. Swaroop. Uh, what, what do you think? Uh, I, you know, I would imagine that you, you do have uh, a pipeline of very talented people with a lot of experience. Uh, it might perhaps be a waste not to utilize this uh, prized human resource, but what is the best way of ensuring that you're not actually falling for crumbs? Uh, that you're, you know, there is no quid pro quo, so to speak, which is something that you highlight in the book. Shireen, in the chapter that I've written, I clearly laid out that there's no point in wasting the talent and experience it should be utilized. I'm questioning the manner in which it happens. And that's why I use the word apply. I personally would believe that having held the post of Secretary of Government of India, it would be below my dignity to apply for a post. If the government so deems fit, should pick it up. Now, what should be the process? Process should not be a favor to somebody. It should be through an agency like UPSC. There could be a separate agency which comes up with a panel and government picks up for a post retirement assignment. So government does not directly grant favors. It is in the so to granting of favors that problem arises. The example that we were discussing earlier when we were discussing dissent, I think that also holds good. You know, you have somebody you pick up from nowhere and you make him somewhere. But if you have an institution like UPSC selecting it, no one would point a finger. Yes, I'm convinced that the talent and experience should not be wasted, but the process needs to be looked at. In some cases, there is a process, but in most of the cases, there isn't. you just pick up somebody and you post him there without looking at his experience or anything, it's a favor. And I've seen officers keeping quiet just before the retirement for probably looking for something that's post retirement. It's the saddest thing that I saw. And I used to argue with some of them, why don't you speak up there? They used to advise me to keep quiet, but you know, someone asked me, why do you speak so much? I said, I don't need anything from the government post retirement. And I'm able to speak because of that. You should be doing the same thing. That's, that's troublesome. That's really troublesome because I've seen outstanding officers competent officers, efficient officers, changing the way they speak. They're still very nice, brilliant, no doubt about it, but they don't speak their mind out. I have used this term intellectual dishonesty for such officers because they feel something strongly. You know, I have given in a chapter 
this whole scheme of Aishman are a thing to be. As a consequence yeah. of the battle that I had with the Prime Minister, in the presence of an officer who was a part of a three-member committee of secretaries, had condemned the Rashtriya Swasthya Bima Yojana. He didn't speak a word during the meeting. Mm -hmm. The Prime Minister agreed with me and Aishman Bharat came with me. That's intellectual dishonesty. He should have yeah. spoken up. If you have a point of view, speak up, irrespective of what the consequence. Many questions coming in, so let me uh, start taking some of the questions that have come in. Anjani Agarwal has uh, written in saying, should India look at revamping the performance appraisal process for civil servants, more structured, not exposed to the vagaries of the political system? Ms. Ghosh, would you like to take that? You're on mute now. Yes, yes. You know, Anil has written a lot about the appraisal systems in government. Earlier, they used to be tremendously opaque. Now they're so open, people cannot really express themselves because you're supposed to tell the person who's in a praise that this is what I think about you. So everybody wants to be in the good books of the team. So nothing negative is going to come through. And in this, you have the 360 degree review business also thrown in. And, you know, the way it is being done, it's something which should just be dissed right now. We like to pick from private sector, but they do it very differently. What we do is assign some retired bureaucrats the task of picking up the phone and finding out, hey, do you know this person? Good, bad, indifferent? Should we? Should we not? And at that point of time, you may say, hey, should I help? Should I not? It's in my hands. So, you know, it depends on the mood that you're in at that point of time and the person at the other end. You know, it's not objective at all. So we can't say that we are doing this to bring in objectivity because we are not. So it's something which needs to be reworked and revamped. And honestly, I firmly believe that in government, we do not value human capital at all. Not at all. Because we claim to have the best and the brightest, especially in the IAS. But what happens to them over the years in service? You know, they are not able to perform they're not given opportunities. They're not given platforms. You know, you just talked about retirement and post-retirement. I'm afraid it goes much beyond that. It starts from the time that you leave your district and come to the secretariat. You're thrown into so many different posts. And how do you get to those posts? Not always because you are the best suited or best qualified. It often happens that you are there because you know the right people and you're pliable and you're user-friendly. So being user-friendly is the most important qualification in service and post-retirement. And you take that from me. I'm so saying with a lot of yes. Yeah, no, so uh, Mrs. Farooq? Put your experience maybe, but yes, that's it. Thank, thanks very much, Ms. Ghosh. We've got many more questions, but till I get uh, the next one in, uh, you know, Mrs. Farooq, do you want to add to that? I mean, how do you, how do you ensure that you can protect uh, to Ms. Ghosh's point, uh, people from the bakeries of the political class, how do you ensure that uh, a bureaucrat that doesn't become user-friendly only to, to serve the political class? Two things. One, I have a full chapter on how to improve the institutions, select leaders first of all, train them as leaders, and develop them as leaders. That's, that's the under... Unfortunately, in our service, some civil servants become leaders. They're not selected leaders. They are brilliant at writing. Some of them write books while in service, some after service. But they're brilliant at writing and writing notes and discussing. That's not leadership. Leadership is much more than that. So we neither select leaders nor do we develop leaders. That's one of it. The other is, you know, the focus of my book is not on others. I can't do a nut to the politician. I mean, it will be an academic discussion if I start saying that politicians should do this and administration should no. It's totally on you. And I am convinced that if a civil servant ceases to expect things out of politicians, mm -hmm. he will stop it. Let me give you an instance. There was an instance when I was trying to protect a junior officer. And by doing so, the minister got very annoyed. He went to the chief minister. He got me transferred out. The chief secretary was very upset. He called me over and asked me, Anil, they were the most important thing in the transfer. Ho I said, sir, why are you asking? For a civil servant, transfer is like that. It is inevitable. It will happen. If something is going to happen, why worry about it? In any case, I believe in Hindu philosophy. I'll be born again. You'll go somewhere else now. When I go over there, I'll do the, the same thing all over again. 
So, so long as I don't expect anything of the politician, to begin with, you know, in my service career, if you look at it, I was transferred on a number of occasions. You know, some bureaucrats have a greater, you know, efficiency in getting transferred. But I was in the building. Later on, perhaps the politician realized that it doesn't bother me at all. You put me wherever you want to put me. The moment the politician feels that I am assured, and I start visiting the politician for getting a transfer, I'm in trouble, he's in trouble, system is in trouble. And I keep saying throughout the book, I have no control whatsoever, and thank you so over the politician. I have no control over the system, but I have enormous control over myself. That's why I say, if you evolve in a particular manner, you know, I didn't face any problem whatsoever. I didn't ask the government to post me as school secretary. Why didn't you feel as school secretary? They wanted to meet me to meet the minister ahead of the thing. I said, no, I can't. You don't post me, don't post me. You know, at least in the IIS, I can tell you, every job is as good as the other. So I don't think I have to really bother. It is when we start having preferences, when we start having expectations from the politicians, we have a problem. Yes, we can discuss the system, how it should be improved. Right. No, I'm thinking of very small changes, changes to yourself. Okay. There's a question that's coming from Vinayak Kohli. Uh, I, I, let me get uh, Dr. Nikhil to take a stab at it. What do you do when your seniors are corrupt and want you to do something which goes against your ethics? What is the way to make the work done and also ensure the safety of your ethics and your health. Well, I think it's a, it's a big challenge in, in terms of civil service. The worst that can happen is you'll probably be transferred out if you, if you really disagree strongly. But if you're talking of our kind of service, you have no option. There's nothing that's going to happen. You got to, you have to fight it out and you or you have to just stay there or you have to quit. So there is no method of replacing anybody. But in the civil service, I suppose, if you're really going to take a stand, I would take a stand, for sure. And if it leads to a transfer, it leads to a transfer. And I think what I uh, noticed in the book and what I've seen in real life also is that the biggest challenge, as Anil is emphasizing, is, is us ourselves. But it's also the fact that it's not the political masters. It is your bureaucratic boss. If he is hand in glove within the whole game, then it's a very, very difficult situation for young officers to deal with. And it is a walking the tightrope. But I suppose I would strongly say that you, one should express their opinions very clearly. And if it's really going to, to an extent that will harm a lot of people, maybe you can you can ask for a transfer. Mr. Swaroop, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. I, if you are clear in your mind, you know, you get settled in about initial five, ten years, people get to know you who you are. And they treat you accordingly. You know, I have seen officers being treated. I have seen officers being respected. So what I keep telling my fellow civil servants is, you look at officers who have gained respect, delivered on the ground in these set of circumstances. They didn't try, try to change the circumstances. They didn't try to change the politician. It's a question of where am I? You have a choice to look at such officers who have done well despite being ethical, despite being honest. They have done well for themselves as well. as If you look at that those officers, then you will say they are exceptions. So look at exceptions. Who stopped you from? It's a question of what the nation wants to know. The question is, <laughs> if if I want to know the better thing, I have those examples. The whole idea of writing such books is to draw attention of my colleagues, civil servants, that if you want, you can, because it has. That's the point that I'm trying to drive home. Yes, there are problems. Yes, there are dilemmas. But if you make the right choice, you can wait to wait. It's not impossible. It's difficult. Certainly difficult. You've got to pay a price, but then you've got to pay a price either this way or that way. You know, you have so many people. I come from UP, where chief secretaries were sent behind the bus. So what did they do? They were dishonest. They paid a price. There are other people who pay a price by getting transferred for being honest. You have to make a choice. You make a choice. That's what I'm presenting. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Ghosh, there's a question, I think, from a young uh, uh, aspirant. Uh, my parents aspire me to hold a high civil servant position and inculcate power for the good. But I'm highly skeptical about being able to change the wrongdoings prevailing for decades now. Your opinion? Well, I think uh, the young aspirant is voicing a very genuine concern. Because when people get into the system, they do want to change. They come in with the right ideas, the right approach, the right attitude. But they find themselves stymied. They find a huge stone wall and they have to try and crash through that stone wall to get things done. But 
I would say that it is possible, it is doable, and that's why you're getting into the civil services. Public service is meant for public goals, public development. So you just have to go ahead with the inspiration, with the zeal, which Anil keeps talking about, and you will make a change. So don't be skeptical. Please go ahead and take the exam and effect the change that your parents and others want you to. Okay. Uh, here's a question in from Pankaj Singh uh, for you, Mr. Swaroop. A public servant has to deal with four ordeals of Sam, Dam, Dun, paid if he travels to Park, let's travel. Uh, how best to deal with the third and the fourth challenge? Dun, Dun, Bhed. Yes. You know, uh, you have to take the consequences of the actions that you take. Be aware of that. Be prepared for that. You will never get penalized if you are prepared for that. Each one goes through that, uh, traverses that road, and their problems faced. You know, no job is easy. Dr. Mittal is sitting here. He, he writes a book. Probably he will someday. He will tell you the problems that he faced. Gurcharan Das, I have read his books. It's not that he had, you know, all bed of roses. He walked through. No, he went through hard times at a personal level. At, at an official level, so to say, everyone goes through those challenges. The key is whether you are able to come out of that, because many people have come out of it. The question is whether, where am I seeking my inspiration from? And mind you, you don't have to go in for pain. Done uh, is for you, but why, why do you differ? You do what you think is right. I, I think Amrish made a very, uh, very important point. Ethics is purely personal, unlike social morality. It's purely personal, and in fact, it changes also. As you become wiser, as you grow, your value system undergoes a change, and your conduct undergoes a change. So it's not all fixed and frozen. You learn from others, you learn from your, your siblings, then your friends, then the society, then your fellow civil servants. You evolve as an individual, that's all you should. And that's how you can come out of it. You learn as you go along. It's not that I didn't commit mistakes. If you read the book, there are failures mentioned. There are many failures that have been mentioned. No one, there's no individual on earth who hasn't failed, who hasn't committed a mistake. The question is whether I can learn from those failures. And That's what is important. Absolutely. Mr. Das, I'll give you the final question. And this one has come in to us uh, from, let me just get that. Uh, from Vinay. No, I think we've taken that question. There was a question that's come in. From Birinder Raut, uh, what are the three main qualities that a civil servant should have? Well, you know, I still talked about three qualities of a leader. And I think they are the same three qualities that I would say a leader in the government or in a company. These are the three qualities of leadership. One, I said, was determination. I think when you, when you look at the great leaders in the world, they were not the most intelligent. They had access to intelligent people, people more intelligent. But themselves, what, you know, often we say, oh, will, will, will power. That's the most important thing I think of all. That's what moves the world. It's not intelligence that moves the world. What moves the world is the heart, the will power. The second quality I said was humility. And humility doesn't mean being goody-goody and all that. It, you can be a very fierce individual. But it shows uh, humility it means that you don't really care in the end who gets the credit for the work that is done. That's what made Kaude so unusual. And the third quality is integrity. And integrity, I think, we made this point that anyone who talks about his integrity, you know that is a, he's suspect. <laughs> integrity is only seen through action. So I would say those are the three qualities. And let me just also join with the last discussion that we were having. Yes. I think that, you know, Anil's book is very good because it provides the individual's perspective, one person looking at solving problems, facing uh, issues. But ultimately, we have to change the institution. We have to improve our institutions. And the tragedy of India is that 
from the Appleby report in the 50, 1950s down to the last Moiley's administrative reforms. These are hundreds of pages people have written. But the answers are almost always the same in these reports. And I think that what we need now is that willpower of somebody who will come and make those institutional changes. We have all the answers are there, whether it comes to appraisal, uh, whether it comes to a whether it should be a job for life. All these are, are, are issues that have been dealt with in these administrative reform reports. And I think it's now really the, the most important thing is that we should ask our it's the prime minister in the end in our country who can make this change. And I feel we have been let down by all those prime ministers because we knew the answers. It's the answers are in Anil's book, but they are in many places. So let me close with that. Thank you. Well, I think uh, you, uh, yes, yes, Dr. Mitter, go ahead. Last line about the book. Uh, Anil, you're narrowing the book as a as a guide for civil services this is a guide for life yes so i think the readership of your book should go way beyond is aspirants or people wanting to enter government service i think i learned a lot even though i know so much about you i still learned a lot and i'm sure many like me would learn a lot so the reach is way beyond uh, government jobs and civil service congratulations and best luck Thank you. yes I, I think that is the perfect note to end this conversation on we have exceeded our time limit and I know that Mrs. Farooq is a, punk, a stickler for punctuality so uh, I am going to stick to time here but thank you very much Dr. Mittal, uh, Ms. Ghosh, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Das and Mr. Farooq for joining us here. I wish you the very best of luck with this second book and uh, as Dr. Mittal said I do hope that it's not just the, those in the service or those looking to get into the service that read it. I think this does hold a mirror to many of us uh, who are outside of the service as well. I'll end by where you start the book with your quote. Muktasar si zindagi ajab se afsane hai, yaha teer bhi chalane hai, parindhe bhi bachane hai. Thank you very much to all of you for joining us here this evening. Thank you. It's a pleasure of thanking everyone who's come here. Thank you very much. I must make a special mention of somebody who's not been mentioned here, was responsible for this book, and that is Mrs. Devika, and she's a dear batchmate and a friend. She did all the editing of the book. My language, I had serious limitations, but we helped me out. Thank you very much. Thank you all of you for sparing time and coming here. And a final thank you to Amrit. I think he's the guy who actually put it into writing this book. I was not. I was pretty reluctant, but he said you must write. And I'm glad I did. I enjoyed writing it, and I hope every reader enjoys it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.